House File 2480 would address the recent news headlines of some school districts denying hot lunch or any lunch at all in some cases to children who can't pay for them. Having any child have their lunch taken away from them and dumped in front of them is something that shouldn't happen in a Minnesota school. But there are not many districts that do that and I want to make it clear that this bill and the intent of this bill is not to vilify school districts but to provide them with the funding so that uh, they don't have to pit their budget against you know feeding these children so that together we're partnering to make sure that all children whose families are struggling financially get a nutritious meal at lunch. On Monday, the House Ways and Means Committee approved House File 2480. The bill would provide a free lunch for students that are currently eligible for reduced price lunches. The program would cost approximately $3.5 million a year. Money would come from the general fund. Last year, our representative Newton carried similar legislation, which unfortunately didn't move forward. There's a great deal of momentum this year. I was very excited when the governor said that he was also behind this bill. So I'm very hopeful that we'll get this bill passed and we'll be able to help these children this year. It is already state law that if a child receives free or reduced price school lunches, he or she gets free breakfast if the school offers free breakfast. Let's now go to our live coverage of the House Floor Session.
house will come to order. Prayer by the chaplain. In my Catholic religious tradition, we are just one week into the 40-day season of Lent, preparing ourselves for the holiest and most important week in our church calendar. For us, it's a time of stripping away anything and everything that impedes us from communion with our God. We fast, we pray more, we give alms to those who are less fortunate than us, and we sacrifice. In the process, it's our hope that we can recognize that material things are always a means to an end and not an end in themselves, and that nothing matters more than our relationship with our God. And as Pope Francis would remind us, that love of God needs to be shared with others, especially the least amongst us. So it's in that spirit that I offer this prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-loving God, we come to you today with hearts full of gratitude for all that you give us, for providing us with everything we need to live our lives as grateful daughters and sons. As this very long winter shows signs of hope that spring will come again, we ask you to give us all hearts that are made new, especially we who are tasked with the great responsibility of caring for our fellow citizens. Provide us with a hope that division and discord may not reign, but instead cooperation and compromise. Melt away any hardness of heart in our own lives so that we may listen to and love one another. Help us to strip away anything that keeps us from loving you fully and doing your will. Help us to be focused on eternal, enduring values, and help us to have the humility to recognize that all human beings, especially the least amongst us, even those with whom we disagree, are our sisters and brothers. Make us ready to sacrifice our own selfish desires, that all our actions may be of service to the citizens of this great state of Minnesota. This we ask in your holy name. Amen. The chaplain for today is Reverend Tony Robleski, Brainerd Area Catholic Church, Brainerd, Minnesota. Pledge of Allegiance, please remain standing and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. The clerk will take the roll. Clerk and close the roll. A quorum is present. The clerk will read the journal of the preceding day. Journal of the House, 88th Session, 2014, 69th Day, St. Paul, Minnesota, Wednesday, March 12, 2014. There's no objection. Further reading of the journal will be dispensed with, and the journal will be correct, uh, approved as corrected by the chief clerk.
Hearing no objection, the journal uh, will be approved as corrected by the chief clerk. Reports of standing committees and division, a copy of this order of business is on each member's desk. If there's no objection, the reports will be adopted. Hearing no objection, the reports are adopted. Second reading of House Files. Second reading House File 917. Second reading. Second reading House File 2091. Second reading. Second reading House File 2178. Second reading. Second reading House File 2255. Second reading. Second reading House File 2375. Second reading. Second reading House File 2571. Second reading. Second reading House File 2621. Second reading House File. Uh, second reading House File 2695. Second reading. Second reading House File 2746. Second reading. Second reading House File 2812. Second reading. Second reading House File 2849. Second reading. Introduction of bills. The following House files have been offered for introduction today. The Chief Clerk will report the House files and give them their first reading. Introduction and first reading of House Files uh, 3018 through 3084. First reading, House Files 3018 to 3084. Calendar for the day. The first bill on the calendar for the day is House File 977. The Clerk will report the bill. House File 977. On the calendar for the day, the first engrossment, an act relating to business organizations. Representative Hortman, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. This bill is a revised Limited Liability Corporation Act. The Uniform Law Commission took a look at the um, LLCs across the country and proposed a Uniform Act in 2006. Minnesota's lawyers studied it uh, over the past eight years, and there's consensus on the changes incorporated in House File 977, and I'd appreciate your support. There are no amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its second, third reading. Third reading, House File 977. Third reading. Any discussion? Seeing no discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. The clerk will close the roll. There being 129 ayes and zero nays, the bill is passed and is title agreed to. The next bill on the calendar for the day is House File 2647. The clerk will report the bill. House File 2647, number two on the calendar for today, an act relating to higher education. The author of the bill, Representative Pulowski. Uh, Mr. Speaker and members, this bill is the unsession bill for higher education. The work began on the bill in November of last year. Both the Republican and Democratic caucuses of the House and Senate have worked on the bill, as has the revisor's office. The bill began as 169 pages submitted by the Office of Higher Ed, Minsky and the University of Minnesota. We have removed all new language, we have removed all new spending, we have removed a commission, and we've removed anything that may be interpreted as something new that was disguised as something that should be repealed. What this bill does is it reorganizes, streamlines, codifies, eliminates, clarifies, updates, and repeals. It is a pale reflection of the work that was done in higher ed in 2013 when we froze tuition for all undergraduates at the University of Minnesota in Minskew, when for the first time we began to address the single biggest issue in higher ed outside of tuition debt, which means we are now beginning to see a decline in debt. We also eliminated the Higher Education Advisory Council, which hadn't met for a year and a half, and we figured since no one was meeting, we could eliminate it. And finally, we eliminated administrative bonuses to the employees who are paid the highest salaries in this state. So while this bill doesn't do all of that, we already did it in 2013, and what we have done is take everything we have taken out of this bill we have given it to the reviser, and the reviser is preparing a reviser's bill for 2015 so we can continue the process of mandate reduction in higher education.
There are no amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House File 2647. Third reading. Any discussion of the bill? Representative Nornis. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, Representative Pulowski, I, I support what we're doing there in higher education. I just wish maybe we had been able to do a little more, but I'm glad to hear that, that continuing uh, into the next year, that, that will be the case. I, I think for all the, all the work and effort that went into this, there really probably is not that much significance that's been made, but at least it's a start. And I, I urge everyone to vote green. Representative Lesh. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Pulaski, is there any provision included in your bill uh, that is repealed or changed uh, for the agencies it governs uh, for which those agencies had originally requested a fiscal note when it was first introduced? And if the answer is yes, what was the total amount of those fiscal notes uh, that would be in there? Uh, Representative Pulaski will yield. Uh, Representative Mr. Pulaski. Speaker, Representative Lesh, we never let the original bill get to the point of introduction. We started with the bill in November of 2013, and we avoided any of that extra work because it was apparent there would have been new spending in this bill if we hadn't taken out certain sections. Representative Lesh. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Representative Pulaski, for that answer. I guess my, my question relates to, I don't sit on all the committees and the finance committees in areas where we've had these unsession bills, uh, but in our committees we've been asking uh, for these repealers and changes, how much savings are we talking about? Because there is kind of, kind of always a dance around the fiscal notes uh, where we rely upon the agencies. Uh, so I'll probably be asking these questions of each bill as it comes on the floor. Um, are we going to get savings? Uh, and if not, what were the original fiscal notes? But thank you for your answer, Representative Plowski. Representative Plowski. Mr. Speaker and members, we went through two pages of single space repealers with Senator Bonoff, with both caucuses and with the revisor's office that took the better part of two days. And we did it to address your concerns that there may be hidden spending. I will give you an example of where there may have been massive spending. They had a repealer on a provision that said that in the interim, Minsk had to send to us any type of property acquisition so we could see it. It would go to Representative Carlson. One of those acquisitions was an abandoned house by Metro State that a person had purchased for a dollar and then was trying to sell back to us for $300,000, and Minsky had tentatively okayed it. Then they had the repealer of the provision for our oversight of that ability to check it. Representative Carlson not only caught it, he went over to Metro State, and now the, the oddity and the irony of all of this is we have a bill in to strengthen our oversight because Minsky tried to repeal it. That's because of the work that was done from November until now. Any other discussion to the bill? Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I just want to say to Chair Pulowski again, it was a pleasure working with you uh, in the committee and I uh, look forward to working on a bipartisan basis and uh, appreciate the uh, education you've given me on higher ed. And I know I'm a slow student, but you're, you keep working at it. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll, uh, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. The clerk will close the roll. Simon votes aye. There being 128 ayes and zero nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. The next bill on the calendar for the day is House File 2665. The clerk will report the bill. 
House File 2665, number three on the calendar for the day, an act, a first engrossment, an act relating to the military. Representative Nelson, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. This is the unsession bill for the Military Affairs Department, and it's even less exciting than the bill that Representative Pulowski just had. It basically consists of five repealers, and all these repealers are stuff that's already taken care of in federal law, so they're not necessary to have in our, in our statutes for, the, for our military affairs. I think the most interesting one is they're repealing 192.16, which is a section about surplus officers, and it says officers of the Guard rendered surplus by disbandment of their organization shall be disposed of. Um, that's probably the most interesting part of this bill, and members, it's a good bill. Please vote green. There are no amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House File 2665. Third reading. Discussion to this bill, Representative Leidegger. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I appreciate this bill, Representative Nelson. Uh, but I, I, think, I think we all should be recognizing Representative uh, Lesh for, for his work on this bill. <clears throat> when this bill first came before the committee, there were uh, provisions in there which would have seriously limited the governor's ability to call up troops if we had had a national emergency uh, and, and the uh, National Guard would have been called up. And if it wasn't for the work of Representative Lesh, uh, we would have basically have been uh, left defenseless in this state had the National Guard been, been called up. So I, I, I really think that all of us here, and I'm sure the governor is probably thinking, thank goodness that, uh, that we had somebody watching these bills as they're, as they're running in through, uh, through these committees at you know, 90 miles an hour and we're trying to, we're trying to watch uh, these bills as they go through. Uh, I know I have two committees tonight at 6 o'clock and I am trying to watch uh, everything that's going on in our committees and, uh, and there are a lot of bills and uh, I used to, I still pride myself in, in trying to stay up with the material that comes before us but it is truly coming at uh, tremendous speed and, uh, and, there, and, we're, and there's mistakes in these bills and I, and I gotta tell you it does remind me of my days in the Navy when uh, during the Cold War you know the United States uh, we built we built for quality and everything that we did our ships we put uh, we put weapon systems on those ships and we ensured that they were quality systems and when we ran something through it worked and we knew it was going to work now our opponents during the uh, Cold War the Soviet Union they believed totally differently. They, be they believed in quantity. They did not believe in quality. They, they were going to overwhelm the United States with as many missiles as they could put up in the air. They built, you know, they had a fleet that was twice the size of ours. And uh, they just thought, well, you know, to heck with quality. Uh, we'll, just, we'll just shoot as much as we possibly can. Well, we, all, we know what won. Uh, we know that uh, the U.S. did win the Cold War. But, but this is what it's, you know, it's reminding me of those days. This is what I'm going through. There are a lot of things that are being thrown at us, and, uh, and I'm not sure that we have the quality in these bills. And I think we all should, uh, should be watching what's going on. And, and once again, I want to thank Representative Lesh for for your work, and I, and I mean that seriously. You did a good job. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the bill.
The clerk will close the roll. There being 128 uh, uh, Representative Wagenius votes aye. There being 129 ayes and zero nays, the bill is passed and is title agreed to. The next bill on the calendar for the day is House File 2480. The clerk will report the bill. House File 2480 on the calendar for the day. The first engrossment, an act relating to education finance. Representative, uh, Representative Seltzer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And before I describe my bill, I would like to thank Governor Dayton and Commissioner Casilius for their wonderful leadership on this issue. I also want to thank the members of Mazone, a faith-based organization that has led the charge to realize this bill. And there are some members watching today in the gallery. I'm grateful to the other 40 plus organizations who have also signed on in support and you do have a list of those organizations at your desk. My bill would eliminate the 40 cent fee per lunch that those who qualify for reduced lunch now pay. This would eliminate the quandary school districts face today and provide them with clear direction and funding that these students need to receive hot lunch. A chill child who has not eaten lunch or has not eaten a nutritious lunch is less likely to do well at school. A child who has not eaten lunch is more likely to overeat when they do have the opportunity to eat. And we all know the issues we face today with childhood obesity. And members, we have a chance to do something about this today. This is a great opportunity, members, in a bipartisan manner to make the statement that no child shall go hungry in a Minnesota school because of the inability to pay. Members, this is a great opportunity to, in a bipartisan manner, partner with our Minnesota schools to make the statement that no child shall go through any shame, worry, or embarrassment as they make their way through the lunch line at school. So members, I urge you to also get behind this bill and vote yes today. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Grunhagen moving to amend House File 2480. The first engrossment as follows. The amendment is coded DE1. Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, members. Uh, I appreciate uh, Representative Seltzer's bill and her concern for the situation in some of our schools where students are having uh, reportedly uh, food dumped versus uh, being able to feed them because they don't have the money or haven't paid their account. And uh, obviously all of us uh, want to see a stop to that. Uh, what my amendment does it tries to empower local individuals to solve the problem versus the state government. And during the testimony at the K-12 Finance Committee, it was brought out that uh, the angel funds uh, that school districts have, and I can't remember the exact number, it was 100, 150, that if an individual uh, contributes money to that angel fund at a local level, it is tax deductible to that individual. Well, my, what my amendment does, members, is it uh, increases that tax deductible to a 75% tax credit. And what, it, what I mean by that is it allows local people, their parents, grandparents, and uh, wealthier individuals from a community to actually solve the problem locally instead of the state coming down uh, with, the, with the funds in order to meet the particular need. Um, this is a long-term solution. Uh, when I was on the school board for 16 years, I was simply amazed by the generosity of businesses and individuals and organizations in our, in our school district that stepped forward when there was a need in the community. And obviously, feeding children can be no greater need. The other thing about this amendment, I believe, it'll, it brings accountability. Because when a, school when a school district receives a voluntary contribution, uh, they know that that con contribution can stop if uh, they don't handle the money properly. 
Uh, so it takes a hundred cent dollar and transfers, transfers it right to the need rather than uh, running it through the uh, uh, state government. And why is that a concern of mine? Well, I'm on the uh, DHS committee and uh, we had a report about a year ago from Inspector Jerry Kerber and he gave several examples of waste fraud, abuse and duplication or overpayments in our DHS budget. So I asked him to send me a letter documenting those and I kept a copy of the letter. Just in five examples, members, over $2.5 million were waste, fraud, abuse, or overpayments in our DHS budget. So the point is this, the state budget can get so big and uh, difficult to, to work with that the uh, opportunity for taking advantage of the budget in a way that uh, mishandles uh, taxpayers' dollars grows the further you are away from your local government. My amendment would actually empower local individuals and local school districts to solve their problem uh, with a hundred cents dollars, not running it through the state, and I believe it would meet the needs of the, uh, of the students who really need it, and also at the same time uh, carefully uh, watch those dollars so there's no waste, fraud, abuse, or, or overpayment. Uh, with that, Mr. Speaker, I will withdraw that amendment. Thank you. Representative Gunhagen withdraws his amendment. There is another amendment at the desk. Uh, the clerk will report the amendment. Guam moving to amend House File 2480, the first engrossment as follows. The amendment is coded A14. Representative Quam. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Uh, in committee, we heard repeatedly no child should be denied a meal. No child should be denied a hot meal. And we all like the honorable intent of this bill, but this bill is flawed because it doesn't do that. It, there are, if you're from a family that's one dollar over the reduced lunch and you have insufficient funds or you've got a situation pops up, you, you're not covered. If you're from a family in the middle of the year, your, your breadwinner parent loses their job, is laid off, and you don't qualify, you don't fit in, you're not covered by this bill. And as often comes with the state level decisions, they don't notice down to the graniality of the individual students in the school that don't fit into the definition that the state gives. Now my amendment is to allow for half of the money that's going to reduce the lunches 20 cents so it's half per, half the price on the reduced the other is block granted to the school so that they, if there's a student that doesn't fit in this definition but there's a need that student who falls outside the narrow definition is not denied a hot lunch is not stigmatized. And if there are none that the teachers know about, the school, the school can still take that block granted money and take all the reduced lunch and make it zero. So in many, I hope that there's not a case of where they need it outside. But I don't know your district or all the school districts in the state and I trust the teachers and the administrators to know their students and their families, to understand that life events pop up not on the schedule, and that people that maybe don't qualify for a defined government, uh, you know, little bucket, they matter just as much as any student. And that with the testifiers and even the author of the bill stated on the floor, no child should go hungry. My amendment is meant to actually do that for the bill and allow the flexibility at the local level 
So we can truly make that statement accurate. Thank you. Representative Seltzer. Well, I want to thank Representative Quam for bringing forward um, this amendment, and I really appreciate your intent. But the point of this bill is consistency and to guarantee that all of our low-income students in Minnesota receive a hot lunch. This bill and its appropriation sends a clear message to all school districts that that should be the case and that, as I have said repeatedly, that no child should be turned away because of an inability to pay. So members, please vote no on this amendment. Representative Kwan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, I appreciate the author's comments. I, I disagree with the shift from no child should be denied to only those that fit in because I know of families in my school district that qualify, that aren't signed up, that would be left out on this. I asked the Department of Education to please provide the delta between the poverty rate, income rate, in the, in the areas, the counties, by county, and the reduced and free lunch so we could understand that because there are situations where the family has a change or because of, of a stigma or pride says, you know, I as a parent am going to provide instead of the state for my children. And uh, so your bucket doesn't cause all of the low income students to be covered and frankly it doesn't cause or allow the option to feed all and not that just those that fall into a classification because one child is just as deserving as another. Representative Seltzer. Well, thank you, Representative Quam, and I appreciate your, your words. And uh, my bill provides uh, funding for 61,500 61, students across our state that now may or may not receive a hot lunch at school. And I would urge you, Representative Quam, if anyone that you know qualifies, that they um, um, submit their application so that they also can uh, take advantage of this benefit. We do not need any more inconsistent policies across our state. And my bill ensures that these children will have their lunches fully funded. So members, please vote no on this amendment. Seeing no further discussion, all in favor of the amendment say aye. aye. All opposed, no. no. Uh, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There is another amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Anderson S. moving to amend House File 2480. The first engrossment as follows. The amendment is coded A15. Representative Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. First off, I'd like to request a roll call, please. Roll call being requested. There's 15 hands. There will be a roll call. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, members, uh, we have heard now from several different parts of the state where when a child has not uh, been able to, does, doesn't have funds in their lunch account, where school districts have placed either a stamp or a label on their lapel to send a message back home to the parents. The unfortunate part of that is essentially you're punishing the child. There's been cases where children have then been bullied by other children, uh, teased about having these labels and so forth. So what this amendment does is it asks that school districts, rather than using this method, many of them do other methods through email and letters home, not label the child because we don't want to see them be punished for something that the adults are responsible for. So that's the uh, amendment in essence, and uh, if you have any questions, I stand here for them. Thank you. Representative Seltzer. Well, I want to thank you, Representative Anderson, for bringing fo forward this amendment and in keeping with our efforts to ensure that our children are not bullied and feel safe and supported at schools. I really appreciate this. Um, and you have brought forward an amendment to ensure that practices do not stigmatize or demean any child brought forward participating in the school lunch program. 
And while I'd like to work with you a little bit, um, Representative Anderson, just to tighten up the definition of what stigmatizing and demeaning is, I appreciate this amendment and I would urge a yes vote on the part of members. Any further discussions? Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll in the amendment. Will close the roll. There being 130 ayes and zero nays, the motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. There's another amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. McDonald moving to amend House File 2480 to the first engrossment as follows. The amendment is coded A18. Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I have an amendment to the amendment as well. There is an amendment to the amendment. The clerk will report the amendment. McDonald moving to amend this amendment to House File 2480 as follows. The amendment is coded A19. Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, thank Representative Newton, who led the charge on this uh, bill last year. Uh, Representative uh, Newton, thank you again. I certainly appreciated working with you last year, as many of you know, and if you don't, I'm going to tell you that I had an amendment on the floor last year that dealt with this very item uh, that uh, took 40 cents and helped pay for the school lunches. But unfortunately, many of you that are sitting down, some listening, some not, uh, voted against it. And that was a shame. So, Representative Seltzer, uh, to you, compliments of bringing this bill forward. Uh, certainly could have saved the taxpayers time and money if you voted for my amendment last year. But uh, duplicative measures are evident here at the Capitol and certainly in politicians. So with that, my amendment basically says, uh, yes, Representative Seltzer, this is very important. Uh, it ought never to happen. And to shout out to the lunch ladies all over our state and especially in Wright County, whom I met with, this is a rare occasion. For those that it has happened, it's wrong. We know that. But let's not pretend that it happens every day, all day, at all school districts. It doesn't. The lunch ladies, the nutrition promens do a great job in uh, providing good food for our students. My amendment says that uh, let's take the money today, let's pay fiscal year 14 to the school districts that need it, let's take the money from the climate centers that the uh, bullion bill passed last year, uh, adopted and put some money into a vault. The climate centers do not exist. It still doesn't exist today, so my amendment takes that money from that pot to pay for the school lunches today to reimburse the schools today, 2014. And I, did I request a roll call, Mr. Speaker? If I not, I'd like to. Roll call has been requested. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Any further discussion on the amendment? Representative Seltzer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, Representative McDonald, thank you for bringing forward um, this amendment. However, what it does, it pits one need in our schools against another need. The need to monitor and support and assist our school districts in making sure that no child feels shamed or bullied, as Representative Anderson was so concerned about in her amendment. And we don't need against children and their um, nutritional needs. And we don't need that kind of pity against um, one need against the other. Commissioner Casilius and Governor Dayton has been very clear in their direction to school districts as to what is expected for the rest of this year. Help is on the way, so I would urge a no vote. Representative Dabney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Uh, Representative Seltzer, thank you. I, too, would urge a no vote. Uh, Representative Anderson's handout sums it up very well. Representative Anderson, thank you for providing this to the body because it illustrates the connection between school lunches or the lack of and bullying. 
And as Representative Seltzer so eloquently said, we shouldn't be pitting one group of vulnerable children against another group of vulnerable children, particularly when some of them may be in the same group. Uh, Representative Anderson certainly illustrates that. Our schools, schools and more importantly our students need resources. The school climate centers will be a resource for schools and districts across the state to implement effective anti-bullying strategies. The money that Representative Seltzer is appropriating for school lunches is a resource that our kids need. Please vote no on the McDonald Amendment. Representative Woodard. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And actually what this does is pit bureaucracy against school lunches. This is a school climate center that does not exist today. This is a million dollars sitting in a vault in St. Paul that could be used today to pay for school lunches. So I certainly encourage you to look at this and think about it before you vote no, because this is a very good amendment. This is exactly what we tried to do last year. It's exactly what the majority has said they want to do this year. This is a good amendment. Vote yes. Representative McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Seltzer, uh, you said that uh, this would take money from one need and put it to the other need. And I uh, respectively disagree with you for the reason that this pot of money for this climate center, for this bullion, uh, is, doesn't exist yet. And, and people in Wright County, and my school district doesn't believe it is necessary because the state already allows a bullion policy. In Minnesota, for those of you who don't know, and those who are watching, please, Minnesota, pay attention, bullion is at an all-time low. It's on a decline in Minnesota. And yet their bullion bill will cost the schools 20 to $25 million per year on something that should not, is not necessary. Bullion should never be allowed, but it is on the decline. Schools have a very effective bullion bill. So there is no need, Representative Dabney, but there is a need today, and that is to feed the children and to pay for it. Today. So I respectfully disagree, and I, I consider and hope that you'll all vote for amend my amendment. And to use Representative Seltzer's words, this is a great opportunity for you to show in a bipartisan manner to vote for my amendment. And there's no shame or worry and embarrassment if you do vote for my amendment. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the amendment. Clerk will close the roll. There being 65 A's and 65 nays, the motion is not, does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. We are on the amendment, the McDonald Amendment. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the amendment say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. Motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. I was looking at you. Mr. Speaker, I was standing. No. Uh, there are no men's further amendments at the desk. The uh, uh, clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House File 2480. As amended. Third reading. Further discussion of the bill. Representative Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, I first off want to start by thanking Representative Seltzer for authoring this legislation and bringing it forward. Uh, we had a good discussion on this last session. Um, Representative Newton also brought a bill forward, and we had um, very compelling testimony in our education committee's last session. And uh, um, we learned how important this issue was that no child should go uh, away hungry. And it's very unfortunate that we were not able to deal with this last session. Uh, as Representative McDonald mentioned, he had an amendment on the floor to the education bill last session that would have funded these lunches. And uh, I supported that amendment. 
and many of us did, but unfortunately that amendment failed. And so I'm disappointed that we weren't able to do something about it last session, but I'm glad that Representative Seltzer has brought it forward so that we can address it this session, um, because over the last several months, this issue has gained a lot of media attention. It's prompted Governor Dayton and Commissioner Casilius to address the issue and to call out school staff and insist that they make sure that no child goes away hungry. My concern with that is that it essentially puts an unfunded mandate on the schools if we don't fund these school lunches. This past week I was able to have an opportunity to meet with the school staff at, from my school district, the lunch ladies, as they're affectionately known as, and hear their concerns about this issue and their concerns that, um, that they not be expected to make up the difference if we put that unfunded mandate on them. So that's why it's so important that we provide the funding in this bill. And they also shared uh, their concerns that they had gotten a bad rap from the media. They work really, really hard to make sure that no child goes away hungry, and they work hard to contact parents and ensure that they're working with them to make sure those meals are paid for. Um, and unfortunately, in our economic times and, and with family struggles, um, there are families that aren't able to make that payment. And this is an opportunity for us to help support those families. And I want to remind everyone that the stickering and the um, trade dumping that you may have heard in, in the media is very rare, and, and I'm grateful for that. But it should never happen, and I'm hopeful that um, by passing this bill today, we're on the right track to help address those, those rare instances. And our school lunch staff do the best they can. And another struggle that they have is dealing with the federal regulations on what kind of food that they need to provide to students. And that has an increased cost because it's a higher quality food and more nutritious, such as whole grains and uh, more fruits and vegetables, which is very important for our students to have that healthy and nutritious food so that they can be well fed and, and nourished so that they can focus on their studies. Because this is such an important issue, I also introduced legislation uh, similar to Representative Seltzer's, and uh, we had the opportunity to speak to it in committee together, and I'm very encouraged that this bill is on the floor today. But again, I am disappointed that this was not addressed last session. And I'm also disappointed that this bill does not provide the funding until next year. We have the need now, and we should be providing the funding now. But it is better late than never, and I urge members to vote green on this bill. Thank you. Representative Woodard. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, too, would like to thank the author and Representative Newton, who's worked on this for several years, Representative McDonald, who has uh, done a lot of work on this issue as well, and Chair Marquardt for hearing this uh, this year as well as last year. Uh, I think this is a, a good correction. Uh, from last year, and so I am, I am very grateful that this will be a bipartisan vote in a few minutes uh, that really does directly help our kids in Minnesota. So I would like to thank um, those people for, for really working very hard on this. The unfortunate thing is that there are some hard feelings about this, uh, including the school nutrition directors who really did feel a little slighted uh, by the commissioner's uh, memo to the superintendents. And so I would like to thank them as well. Uh, because I think they do a great job every day in providing uh, a nutritious meal for our kids, uh, whether they're free and reduced or whether they're uh, kids of the middle class or, the, or even our upper class here in Minnesota. So I would like to thank the lunch ladies, the folks who really do a good job, uh, the men and women who are helping um, ensure that they do get that nutritious meal. I think it's uh, certainly um, recumbent upon us to thank them as well and uh, look forward to a good bipartisan vote on this bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Marquardt. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker and members. And I'd like to uh, congratulate uh, and thank uh, Representative Selzer for working bipartisanship across both aisles here, across the aisle, to bring this bill together. And uh, the strength of this bill is it doesn't pit one group or one need of education against the other. It is going to fund that. Uh, also, the schools can use some of those funds that they've used to cover some of these meals, put that back into the classroom. We know also that funding uh, that goes to our students to keep them fed and nourished will help get us to the world's best workforce. 
And also a thank you to uh, Republican lead Representative Woodard for the cooperation and bipartisanship on this bill. But thanks again, Representative Selzer, for your leadership. Representative Selzer. I would like to thank members for all of their good work on this bill and all the support that has come forward. And I, I neglected to mention earlier that this bill was one of only four bills endorsed by our bipartisan House Childhood Obesity Working Group. So I would like to thank that organization. I want to also mention that the Minnesota School Nutritionists have um, stood with us. This was their number one priority this year, and we appreciate their support. Our school districts have done a great job with not much direction from us and not much help, and now we're coming and we are providing the direction and we are providing the funding so that, again, together in a bipartisan fashion, we can say that no child in the great state of Minnesota is going to go hungry because of an inability to pay. Thank you very much, and I would encourage a yes vote. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. Close the roll. There being 130 ayes and zero nays, the bill is passed as amended and its title agreed to. <laughs> motions and resolutions. Uh, there are copies of non controversial motions and resolutions online and at the desk. Uh, if there is no objection, we'll take those first. Hearing no objection, those motions prevail. Newton moves that House File 1916 be recalled from the Committee on Transportation Finance and re-referred to the Committee on Transportation Policy. Newton? Representative Newton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This bill has to do with uh, license plates, and it should go to policy before it goes to finance. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. All opposed, no. Motion prevails. Hortman moves that House File 2213, now on the General Register, be re-referred to the Committee on Commerce and Consumer Protection, Finance, and Policy. Representative Hortman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's my understanding that the Commerce Chair would like to see this bill, and I ask that the bill be sent there. Representative Garofalo. Could the author just uh, tell us what the bill is? Representative Hortman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I believe it's a technical corrections bill brought forward by the Minnesota Bankers Association and the Minnesota Legal Aid Society. It's a Peace in the Valley bill. Uh, seeing no further discussion, all in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, no. Motion prevails. Gavney moves that House File 2606 be recalled from the Committee on Agriculture Policy and re referred to the Committee on Taxes. Representative Dabney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, House File 2606 is about the bonding capacity of the Minnesota Agriculture Society, better known as the Great Minnesota Get-Together. As it's uh, regarding uh, public finance, it properly belongs in taxes. Both chairs are okay with the uh, move. Thank you. Any discussions? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, no. Motion prevails. Huntley moves that House File 2656 be recalled from the Committee on Civil Law and re referred to the Committee on Health and Human Services Finance. Representative Huntley. Uh, members, this is a bill that changes what we're doing with what's called the All Payer Database. And the All Payer Database takes health care spending and billing and uh, looks at its, uh, the, the, the Names are taken off it. Uh, the Social Security numbers don't show up. And we are currently correcting, collecting this data, and uh, nothing of personal information has been leaked. Uh, when we set this up, it was for a one particular reason, and that was called provider peer grouping. And what the heck does that mean? 
It means that we're going to look at individual hospitals and compare them uh, and let those results be out. It means we're going to look at individual clinics and compare them and have those results published. Uh, we're not, they tried to do this for about four years and the Department of Health couldn't get the system to work. So what this bill does then is defer the provider peer grouping and adds other things that they can do with this data that they already have. And the four things that this allows them to do uh, is evaluate healthcare home program, which is something we set up in like 2008, uh, which provides for coordinated care and payment for coordinated care of people with chronic illnesses. We just had a report from the Department of Health, uh, which they looked at the data, but they could only look at medical assistance data because this was not in the uh, permitted use of that data. Uh, but they looked at the MA data, and it saved us 9%. There's 9% reduction in cost. Uh, what, if we started using the all-payer database, then we could also look at what private insurance is doing. And, and in none of these cases would there ever be identified any individual hospital and in what they were doing or any individual clinic. They would, it would simply be uh, unidentified uh, data but it would say whether the private insurance companies are doing as good a job as we're doing with uh, our medical assistance patients, saving 9%. It would also allow them to look at hospital readmission rates. Again, the names of the hospitals would not be identified. Uh, and uh, the third thing it allows is uh, to look at uh, Healthcare spending, quality utilization, and illness, bur illness burden based on geographic areas or populations. And the last thing it would do would be allow them to use this data to look at a program called State Innovation Model, which we already is up and running. Uh, we're getting the data uh, delivered to the Department of Health. Uh, but this would allow them to use that data uh, to write a report and see if this program is working better than uh, the other programs. Again, in none of these cases uh, would the hospitals be, uh, names be released, would the uh, 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 clinics names be released. Uh, it would simply uh, look at the data in, in a statewide basis. Uh, this was a, initially a very controversial thing, but it's now been approved by the Minnesota Medical Association. It's been approved by the health plans. Uh, it's been approved by the hospital association. And uh, I'm spacing one because there's four groups that uh, have put this plan together, and they all uh, support it. So I urge your support. Representative Scott. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I've been back and forth with Representative Huntley and Representative Lash and Representative Holberg on this issue because I'm my hesitancy here is that the the data that's being that's collected is not going to be now used for the same purpose that it was originally um, earmarked for, if you will. So they're going to be changing what this data is used for, and I just have a, a real a level of discomfort with that. And I believe that it needs to come to the Civil Law Committee. And I, I know that um, Representative Lesh is, is speaking with um, Representative Huntley about this right now. And I, I would um, hope that um, we could have his support to, to go ahead and hear this in the Civil Law Committee. Representative Huntley. Uh, Mr. Speaker and members, uh, I would like to withdraw this motion. The motion is withdrawn. Simonson moving to uh, moves that House File 2910 be recalled from the Committee on Ag Policy and re referred to the Committee on Public Safety Finance and Policy. Representative Simonson. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, that is my motion, and uh, we just want to see this bill in public safety before it goes back to ag policy. Any discussion? Representative Holberg. Mr. Speaker, it would be helpful to the body if you would explain what the bill is about. Representative Simonson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. This is a, this is a bill about animal cruelty, and part of it falls under the provisions of the Department of Public Safety, so it will go to public safety first and then back to ag policy. Seeing no uh, further discussion, all in favor of the motion say aye. All opposed, no. The motion prevails. Gill moves that House File 2961 be recalled from the Committee on Environment, Natural Resources, and Ag Finance be referred to the Committee on Transportation Policy. Representative Dill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, the bill has to do with disabled, 100% uh, disabled veterans being able to get uh, that status put on their driver's license. It's currently, and we thought inappropriately, put into Environment Finance, and uh, we are asking to go to Transportation Policy, Representative Earhart. Earhart. Seeing no further discussion, all in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, no. Motion prevails. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, members at your desks, you will find uh, the program evaluation topic selection. Uh, the deadline is tomorrow for members to turn in uh, topics. Uh, Representative Beard, Representative Holberg, myself, Representative Falk, uh, Representative Simon, and Representative Erickson uh, would be able to accept these. Uh, we, a number of members have been bringing them over already. Uh, these are the topics that you would like to be considered. And then in a couple of weeks, you will be getting the list that you can vote on uh, for topics to be narrowed down. And then one more uh, selection before the end of the year on the topics that will be selected for auditing. I also want to uh, note that there is a, a report released tomorrow on the uh, Councils of Color and uh, one the following week on the Ag Commodity Groups and there is one on pavement selection for transportation. I know that members are looking forward for that one. So uh, thank you and if you have any questions, let me know. So we're on announcements. Representative Murphy M. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, on behalf of all the members of the St. Louis County delegation and Lake County delegation, I want to thank you for your hospitality and open doors and listening to the many people that came to talk to you about their issues from St. Louis County in St. Louis County and Duluth days. One more favor we have to ask. Please join with us in celebrating because this morning at the breakfast for St. Louis County and Duluth Days Tom Huntley received a proclamation from Governor Dayton and Lieutenant Governor Yvonne Pretner Solon and in Minnesota throughout all of Minnesota it's Tom Huntley Day in Minnesota Further announcements? Okay. Representative Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. I move that when the House adjourns today, it adjourns until 3 p.m. Monday, March 17th, St. Patrick's Day, 2014. Representative Murphy moves that when the House adjourns today, it adjourns until 3 p.m. Monday, March 17th, 2014. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, no. The motion prevails. Representative Murphy. I move that the House do now adjourn. Representative Murphy moves that the House do now adjourn. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, no. The motion prevails. The House stands adjourned until 3 p.m. Monday, March 17, 2014.